It's a great honor to have uh, Michelle Nelson Zweig to start this meeting. Um, a little bit of a brief history. Michelle was Ralph Steinman's first postdoctoral fellow, uh, or no, graduate student, graduate student. And then from there, Michelle went to do his uh, medical training up the Mass General and went to do his work, his scientific work up there with Phil Leader, and then um, ultimately came back to Rockefeller. And I think right now you are the Ralph Steinman professor uh, at Rockefeller. But uh, Michelle, I think, is one of the great biologists in the world. He um, really is a pioneer and done a, a lot, if not most, of the seminal work in B cell development and dendritic cell development. But what I think is uh, most special about Michelle is tonight he's going to take you to um, what I think we all aspire to do, is, is to understand scientific mechanism and then apply it, and, and he's applying um, his wisdom and his technical skills and his brains to HIV, which is probably the toughest vaccine we could ever develop. And having been in um, a center that's trying to make an HIV vaccine, uh, Michelle's contributions have been enormous and um, really seminal of the field. And so you're gonna see him take you through what probably starts in his ideas in doing really elegant mouse mechanistic work to uh, write into something that um, perhaps is the big prize in being able to neutralize HIV. So with that is a brief background. Let's welcome Michelle. Okay. Well, Bob, thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks very much for that uh, introduction. Um, okay, so um, let's get started. All right, so what I want to do today is I want to go through um, how I'm, I'm thinking and my colleagues are thinking about this problem. Um, and I'm going to start with um, just a little bit of background immunology. Very simple stuff, uh, but background information that I think we all have to have um, and for this. And so hopefully I won't bore you too much. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, HIV and the antibody problem. Okay, so to begin with, um, I guess I've been in immunology for a long time since I was a high school student in Dick Dutton's lab. Uh, so I think about um, B cell responses this way, uh, a very simplified way anyway. Um, and this is uh, Burnett's idea with uh, Talmadge and, and uh, Letterberg, actually. Uh, so immune systems have three properties that we all care about. They have specificity, diversity, and memory. And all three of these properties can be accounted for by this little diagram. So each of these cells has a different receptor, different color, different specificity. Um, there's diversity because they're all different colors and they all have different identities in terms of their antibodies. And memory in this kind of scheme uh, comes uh, from the following. The, the B cell that is the antigen-specific B cell is selected to interact with the T cell and dendritic cell by antigen. And it expands, it undergoes clonal expansion, and that clonal expansion leads to a larger group of cells, which when the antigen comes back, results in a faster, better response. A lot of immunology, I believe, can be explained by this. But there is one thing, many things, in fact, that cannot. Uh, one thing that I care about is this, um, uh, affinity maturation. And this uh, is something that was discovered by Siskin and Benasraf and also Herman Eisen at around the same time. And we all know it because when we immunize <laughs> bunnies, we know that the antibody affinities go up with time, and that's what they found. And you can't really explain that by the Burnett model. Uh, it takes a little bit more. And what it takes is what Weiger discovered, which is somatic hypermutation and selection. And um, so what the B cell does is something completely nutty uh, if you were to start to do this by first principles, which is that when it starts this uh, expansion, this clonal expansion, what it does is it diversifies. It mutates uh, its antibody genes and it uses a mutator which is not entirely specific for antibodies. A little bit nutty. Uh, and after this clonal expansion, uh, then there is selection and the best clone is selected. And the enzyme 
that does this mutation is AID, discovered by Hanjo. Um, and what it does, um, we know essentially from this model, which was from Michael Neuberger, uh, it deaminates a cytosine and makes it into a uracil, a fairly simple thing, this amino group becomes this, and you get this mismatch. And the mismatch is then handled by the cell using normal uh, DNA repair mechanisms to produce either a mutation, gene conversion, class switching, or chromosome translocations. This thing happens uh, in a region downstream of promoters. Uh, the enzyme AID is recruited there uh, by factors which are involved in the stalling of polymerase, which is very convenient because this enzyme likes single-stranded DNA, and that's uh, seen at the site of polymerase stalling. Now, all of this reaction occurs in these beautiful structures called germinal centers, uh, which have two zones. They have a, a dark zone and they have a light zone. The dark zone is the place where B cells are dividing and mutating, um, just here. This thing is very dynamic and the cells migrate after making mutations. They migrate up into this light zone, and that light zone is where the antigen is trapped. Uh, they capture the antigen there, they process it, they present it to T cells, and the T cells are in fact the limiting factor in selecting the right B cell to return to the dark zone and divide again, um, and so on. And this is a cyclic process. You can diagram it like this. You have cell division here, mutation, migration, uh, to the light zone, uh, and then selection, and then return to the dark zone by the selected cell. So you see an amplification if you do this iteratively. Um, and so this model is a so-called cyclic reentry model for the germinal center. Okay, now mutation, I mentioned, uh, is not entirely specific, but it's focused. Uh, it's focused on uh, these parts of the antibody. These are the complementarity determining loops of, of the antibody. Um, and those are um, supported by, by these uh, structures here, which are the frameworks. Um, and mutation is focused here, and that makes sense because this is the part that touches the antigen, and the other bits uh, hold it up. Now, although mutation is um, not entirely random, it's focused there. It's focused on those um, CDRs because they have more hotspots for this enzyme AID. Uh, it's not entirely sequence specific. It cannot be because it would defeat the purpose. It needs to be as diverse as it can be uh, so it doesn't see a specific sequence, but it likes these hotspots. And um, then the other way in which this enzyme is focused is by codon usage bias, um, which has evolved such that it's harder to make an amino acid change in the frameworks than it is to make an amino acid change in the CDR. Okay, so that's the background. Let's talk about this. Um, so this is a big problem. I'm not going to go through the, the, the public health thing, but everybody knows this is a big problem. And 30 years later, to everybody's embarrassment, there's no vaccine. And why is that? Why don't we have one? Okay. So this has been depressing for a long time. And we all know that vaccines, some of us love T cells. So, uh, <laughs> we all know that most vaccines are antibody, uh, require an antibody. And um, for a long, long time, these were the best antibodies that anybody ever got out of uh, an, an infected person. Um, and so the way you read this graph is here's the neutralizing breath, 100%, and here's the neutralizing potency, uh, IC50, and it takes 10 micrograms per mil for uh, something like 25% of the strains to be neutralized by this particular antibody, which it turns out is the best of these four because these two are very self-reactive and essentially very difficult to find in nature. 
uh, as is this one. So this one here was called B12. It, it was phage derived. But anyway, you can see that it takes a lot, a lot of antibody to neutralize not that many strains. And it was felt that this was unachievable by vaccination. This amount of antibody response was just not, you, you couldn't get it. So that's bad. Uh, the other bad thing is this thing, which is the spike. That's the only thing on the surface of the virus. Uh, it's highly variable. We know that from mutations. But the other bad thing about it is it's covered in this glycan, the blue stuff, uh, which shields it, protects it from antibodies. But it's, it's not entirely horrible because, let's see, if we go back here, there's some bits here, for example, the CD4 binding site that has to be conserved because that's the way the thing gets into a cell. So some parts of this have to be conserved. There have to be parts of it that maybe an antibody could get. So that's good news. The other bit of good news is that a few individuals, and it, this percentage will vary. See, I put 5 to 10 percent, but it could, some people say 20 percent. Depends on how you draw the bars and the lines, but some individuals develop broadly neutralizing serum antibodies. Okay, so that means that if you take their serum and you stick it in a dish and you try to block infection, it will block infection and it'll block infection of nearly all strains and at low concentration. So that's, that's a good thing. But it's a funny kind of antibody response because it only comes up very late most of the time. It takes a couple of years to develop this two or three years. So I got into this with a graduate student and um, asking the following questions. What is the content of this B cell response? What is it that is doing this neutralization? Um, and we started actually with the help of people um, at the VRC, uh, John Mascola in particular and Rich Wyatt and also uh, together uh, with um, Bruce Walker in Boston, who had uh, lots of patients that, that, that he could help us with. And we wanted to know whether it was one broad and potent monoclonal that these people were making, several different antibodies against one big old neutralizing epitope, the one magic epitope, or different antibodies against different epitopes. And we had to find a way of getting these cells out so that we could figure this out. And the method that we developed was a modification of something that Hedda Wardeman had developed in my lab, and it was done by Johannes Scheid and Hugo McKay. And what they did was just to use the antigen, the soluble protein, as a bait uh, to fish out the cells that had the right antibody uh, on their surface, cells that were producing this. Single cell cloning and then heavy and light chains cloned out by PCR and transfection to reproduce the antibody. So we started with this, and now we're here, uh, which is a big, long way, but in a very short time. And this is the work of many laboratories that have adapted the same method, uh, including uh, the VRC uh, and um, uh, Dennis Burton at Scripps and Bart Haynes at, uh, at Duke uh, primarily, but others in South Africa and all over the world, actually. So. That's a big difference in terms of the neutralizing potency. And you can see that some of these antibodies are neutralizing a very large percentage of the strains that are being tested. So very potent and very broad. The other thing that's come out of this is that we've learned that the CD4 binding site is not the only site which is the broad neutralizing site. There are many sites that are broad neutralizing sites. Uh, so for example, at the top of the molecule, uh, there's a region uh, at uh, the base of the V1, V2 loops, if you know the structure, uh, that's targeted by PG-16, cloned by Dennis Burton. There's another region here, it's around the V3 loop, a uh, whole series of antibodies that are broadly neutralizing there. Uh, here's the CD4 binding site. There's another site just below the CD4 binding site that's targeted by this antibody, 8AMC195. It's a new epitope. There's this one that has, the epitope is still not known. And then there is an epitope down here at the membrane proximal region. So there are many ways of neutralizing this virus broadly, not just the CD4 binding site. So what else came from this single cell approach? Well, uh, we learned something about the memory B cell compartment, lots of different clones uh, of anti-HIV antibodies, many of which neutralize some fraction of viruses, but not, don't have breadth. Uh, 
broad neutralization, we've learned, can be achieved by a single monoclonal in occasional patients, but more frequently, it's a combination of antibodies to different epitopes. Um, many different epitopes, I've been through that. And the most interesting thing, sort of for me at least, at the beginning was high levels of somatic hypermutation. So some of these antibodies have up to 100 mutations out of 300 nucleotides in the region. That means you can change every single amino acid in the region um, for these some of these antibodies. And these mutations, they're not just passengers. They're essential because if you revert them, so here's IC50, red is good, white is bad uh, for several of these antibodies. And now revert them to the germline, and they're completely inactive. And they also fail to bind in SPR. So it's important to make the mutations. Why so many mutations? Because, you know, if the antigen binding part is just right here, then you should not need so many mutations to change it as much as you want and achieve higher affinity. This doesn't really make much sense. And we also know, by the way, that these barrels here that hold up the blue parts, the invariant, essentially invariant parts of antibodies, um, can be uh, used to receive those loops and, and, and by transferring the loops, of course, you get you change the um, activity of the antibody. That's the basis for everything that's in the clinic today, just about. These were made in mice, and then loops were transferred from mouse to man. And because the frameworks don't matter and the CDRs matter, you could transfer the activity of the antibody. OK, so is that true for HIV? Well, so this is a work of Florian Klein. It was published recently. I'm just going to go through it a little bit. Here is the framework regions of uh, lim antibodies with limited neutralizing activity against HIV. That means they neutralize some strains, but not others. And you can see that the framework regions, which we've outlined here, do have mutations. And if we revert the mutations, it doesn't much matter. And that's shown here because you can see here is the mature antibody. These are different strains of HIV. Each bar is a different strain. Red is good neutralization, yellow is worse, white is no good. You revert the frameworks to germline, and it's pretty <coughs> much unchanged. And that's what you expect from all different kinds of antibodies, not just HIV antibodies. Now here's broadly neutralizing <coughs> antibodies to HIV. And you can see that their frameworks are very heavily mutated. Uh, the blues are insertions or deletions, and then the rest of it is replacement or silent mutations, lots and lots of mutations. If you do the same experiment now with these antibodies, you get an entirely different result. And this is a, a large number of these from different laboratories, including our own. So here's the mature, and here's the framework reverted. And it's entirely lost its activity. And that's true for most of them. Why is that? Well. The reason is because these antibodies are doing some different things with their frameworks, including uh, contacting, as is in this diagram from Bill Sheaf, including contacting the antigen directly. So maybe it's just the, the fact that the frameworks are being used for contact. Uh, that, that's why they're important. But that's not entirely true, because if you take, we, we've got a lot of structures uh, from uh, our own work with Pamela Bjorkman and with Peter Fong and Ian Wilson and, and several others who really learned a lot about these antibodies. And we can revert everything uh, that's uh, not a contact and leave the contact residues alone. And you still get loss of activity. And that's because they're doing s these non-contact residues are doing strange things like this in this structure from Pamela Bjorkman. So here is the normal framework that's stabilized um, by these bonds. And there's a mutation that destabilizes this framework right here, this proline. And destabilizing the framework should make it worse, but in fact, it makes it better in this case. So additional flexibility, destabilizing the antibody actually makes it a better antibody in this case. OK, so how do we think about what's happening here, all this somatic mutation. Why is it happening? How is it happening? And how does, what does this have to do with the development of the antibody? So um, I think this um, work from our lab and work from 
Bart Haynes, and now also from uh, Lynn Morris, um, supports a model like the one I'm going to propose here, which is that the virus comes in, it's a trimer, so that's this diagram, it elicits an antibody, and that antibody neutralizes this virus. Uh, but it also selects for variants which are not neutralized by the antibody, and that happens very quickly, and that happens in everybody that's infected. Now, the uh, resistant variant emerges. There's still some affinity for this antibody, and so this antibody chases this virus into the germinal center where it gets mutated again, um, and then neutralizes this virus, and it escapes. And the other antibody comes in and chases it, and so on. And it's an arms race between the virus and the antibody until at the very end of the day, in some individuals, you have a broadly neutralizing antibody. So just to summarize this a little bit, uh, framework mutation um, is essential for the breadth and potency of these highly somatically mutated anti-HIV antibodies. That's a common thread, irrespective of where the antibody binds on the virus. Uh, these are essential for contact and also probably for the shape and flexibility of the antibody. And this may explain why it takes so long to develop this, because the whole system is rigged against making a framework mutation. But if you require it, you're going to have to work very hard to get it. Okay, so one of the interesting things that we learned um, as a field, essentially, um, when we started doing this cloning, is that uh, some antibodies to some of these sites share a number of features. So here are antibodies cloned from five different individuals in different laboratories, uh, many of them from our lab. And you can see that and these are all CD4 binding site antibodies. They share uh, many different sequence features. And what was surprising about these antibodies is that although they share all those features and although they have all those mutations, they come from just two germline variables. So everybody who's made these antibodies has started with this. And they end up with something that's, that you can almost, su you can superimpose the structures just about in different people. And that's shown here for two of these, one from our lab, 3BNT60 and BRC01, which was the first example of this cloned at, at the BRC. Uh, and you can just see just how similar these are. And they are not just similar to themselves, but they are also similar to CD4, which they mimic. And their mechanism of binding to the CD4 binding site is nearly identical. So interesting surprise that several of the uh, CD4 binding site antibodies develop from just two closely related variable genes in five and now many more uh, unrelated individuals. And despite their origins in different patients, they have shared critical architectural features. So because we'd cloned very many of these, and especially from a single patient, we were able to uh, get large clones with antibodies having different levels of mutation and different activities, we could start to see if we could understand the molecular basis for neutralization and high levels of neutralization. So Pamela Bjorkman and her colleagues, uh, in collaboration with us, solved the structure of, of some of these variants. And one of these is shown here. And the difference, what makes this a better antibody for neutralization than others in the same group, is this insertion right here, core residue insertion. I'm going to show you what that does in this movie. So the heavy chain is blue, and the light chain is green, and then the HIV is down below. It's, um, it's got some domains that you can outline, an inner and an outer domain, and a bridging sheet. And what's happening here is that uh, this insertion is reaching over um, from uh, this uh, inner domain to this outer domain, increasing the surface contact area. And that's, we believe, what makes it a better antibody. Now, if we're really understanding how these things work, we may be able to make them even better. And so I'm just going to show you how related these antibodies are to the CD4. Um, 
and that's shown here. Um, CD4 is in red and the antibody is in blue and they're very closely superimposable with the exception of this little phenylalanine that digs down into this pocket which is in CD4 but not in the antibody. So if we really understand what's making something better, maybe we can do it by making just a mutation here. This is the work of Ron Diskin and inserting something like this phenylalanine into the antibody. And so Ron did that, single point mutation. And he started with an antibody that looked like this, the red one, and the point mutant looks like this. So 10 times better in terms of its activity. So we really begin to understand something about how these things work. All right, so this inner domain and this bridging sheet um, so for people who are interested in making the vaccines, they've been trying to make pieces of this uh, GP120 in order to make immunogens. And what this antibody demonstrated is that the pieces were not enough because the best antibodies were reaching over onto pieces that were not present in these um, vaccines. All right, so I want to move now to um, what, we've tried, what we're trying to do to um, use these antibodies for uh, maybe practical things. Um, and what we've learned about their activities in terms of um, their ability to present infection and also to suppress infection. All right, so uh, we know that uh, antibodies can be used in um, passive therapy experiments. We've known that for over 100 years uh, and very, very effective uh, in infectious disease here for diphtheria, uh, but mostly today uh, for uh, tumor therapies, anti-tumor therapies. And it was believed that this could not be something that could be used for HIV. And the reason that it was believed that you couldn't do this for HIV was very simple because there was literature that said that you couldn't do it. Uh, so uh, Dennis Burton, first in mice, actually humanized mice, use the antibodies, the old antibodies that I showed you in the beginning, to try to treat, suppress infection in humanized mice. And essentially had almost no effect, except that he could see resistant variants, mutants coming up. And so he concluded that a cocktail of three antibodies here um, could not do anything because a virus is so slippery, it could make so many mutations that you'd get away from anything. And the same experiment was tried in humans. And it was tried in humans by two different groups, Alexander Tricola and Marty Markowitz. And basically, it didn't work. It, it, it was the same result. Um, so it can't work. But they didn't have these new antibodies. And so uh, Florian Klein, a postdoc in the lab, decided to retry the experiment again, just repeat it. But this time, use our antibodies, use the ones that were very, very potent. And the, the model that he used is this NRG mouse, which is a mouse, you, you, when, it, when it's born, you irradiate it, or shortly after birth, and then you inject it with hematopoietic stem cells in the liver, and then it develops human immune cells, not an immune system, just immune cells. Um, and we can infect those mice with HIV, and they get high-level antibody titers, which last for a long time. And if you look at the mean, you can see that after a while, you get some decrease in the titer, <coughs> but it's still really very high. So you can infect them with a human, so it's a human cell, you're infecting them with a human virus, you get a relatively high viral load, it lasts for a long time, CD4 counts decrease with time, and you get viral swarms, that is, you get normal levels of mutation of the virus, because it's a human cell that the virus is infecting. If you take this mouse and you treat it with ART, which is a uh, combination antiretroviral therapy, what's used in humans, viral load drops. If you stop ART, the blue thing, the viral load comes back. That's just like humans. What happens when you treat with antibodies? Well, lots of different things with different antibodies, but basically if you use a single antibody, the best case scenario is like this, where you get a drop in viral load and then it comes right back. And it comes right back because 
uh, B, and this is all the different antibodies, and each one of these groups is a group of mice, and each line is a sequence, so it's a lot of sequences from a lot of mice. But you can see that uh, antibodies that are producing that kind of drop in viremia also produce a, a consistent mutation on all the different mice that are treated with the antibody. And those mutations are not just everywhere in the virus. They're in the very spots that you would predict if you know the structures. So they are exactly in the places where the antibodies are binding. The virus cannot get away in just about anyway. It, it can only get away in certain, by making certain mutations. And that's most evident here with this antibody, where you see that out of all of the sequences that we uh, looked at, nearly every one of them was the same amino acid in different mice. So it didn't get away in a lot of different ways. It had a very, very limited kind of escape. So what we learned, rapid escape, no surprise, Different antibodies induce different spectrum of escape variants depending on their targets. Uh, and the escape variants correspond to the mutations in the known binding site. That's important. So that meant that perhaps we could start combining these things. So if we did that, you can see that in this mixture, we get 99% of all known strains that we had tested. So very, very, very broad and very, very, very potent. And when we administer that mixture to the mice, now we get a different result. So now they go down, and they stay down. You can see that best here with this mean. And here is the control. <coughs> Looks like a couple of mice are not doing the right thing, but there's a reason for that. If you clone those viruses, what you see is that in every single case, there is a stop codon in the spike. That means that there is no spike. So the antibody can't see it, and that's why it's there, but it's also a useless virus. It can't get into a cell. All right, so this is a reminder. This is what happens when you take off ARC. It comes right back. What happens when you treat with antibody and then stop antibody? This is what happens. So the stop is after the gray bar. These are days. And you can see that it takes quite a while for the viremia to come back when it comes back. So long-lasting effect. Uh, and that's simple reason that antibodies, shown here, also last for a long time. So when the antibody level comes down, well, then the viremia goes back up. But it takes a long time for the antibody to clear. When the virus comes back, it's not a mutant. It's been suppressed. It stays suppressed. And you know that because if you retreat the ones that come back with the same mixture, it goes right back down again. Okay, so with this pentamix and now with the trimix and two antibodies and even one antibody now, we know how to do this with. Um, no escape for 60 days on therapy, long-term suppression, an average of 60 days of suppression after stopping therapy, and the latent virus was still sensitive. So um, there's ART. How do the antibodies compare, and what are the combined effects when we see something different when we start combining? And again, remember, Art, when you stop art, boom, viremia comes back. When you use a single antibody, you also see this rapid escape. Now what happens when you put them together? So here in this experiment, what Josh Harwitz has done is he's treated the mice with art and then knocked down the viral load, started antibody, and got rid of art. So now, instead of everybody coming back up, with the exception of one, one comes back up and everybody stays down. So when you lower the viral load and put on the antibody, then you don't need all of that pentamix. And what happens when you stop the antibody? Well, it's the same thing. This guy stays down, this guy stays down, now this one never comes back, this one never comes back, this one uh, comes back. So initially lowering the viral load with ART synergizes actually with the antibody monotherapy and leads to prolonged control of viremia. And of course, different antibodies differ in efficacy here. Okay, now David Baltimore has, has come up with this idea that you can use these antibodies, and actually Phil Johnson, before him, um, 
as, as a potentially to protect uh, if, you, uh, if you use a viral vector to deliver them as a vaccine, a passive vaccine. So put them in a virus, make the virus express the antibody, and then you'll protect. And that actually works in, you know, um, for protection. And we tried it for therapy. So we did the same experiment with ART, knock down the viral load, and then put in an antibody with AAV, and it actually worked. So that's a one-shot therapy. I'm not saying that that's what we should do, and I'm not saying it's practical, but it's a proof of principle that you could do something like that. Um, so ART followed by antibody monotherapy with AV results in an effective single shot therapeutic vaccine. And it's just a proof of principle experiment. Now one final thing about this before um, getting towards the end of this talk uh, is that in addition to just lowering the plasma viral load, uh, you also uh, lower um, the cell-associated um, RNA and DNA, which means that you're actually lowering perhaps the reservoir, uh, which is an all-important thing in this, in this in, in the, uh, infection. Okay, to summarize this. Uh, so antibodies lower the viral load in blood, but they also lower cell-associated DNA and RNA in lymphoid tissues, actually, in the mice. Okay, so let's not take ourselves too seriously. Humans are not mice, not even humanized mice. Um, and the um, main difference is really that one worries about our uh, viral load. Um, so humans, a lot bigger viral load, a lot more diversity, um, different reservoirs as well uh, than in a humanized mouse. On the other hand, the mouse that we used has no endogenous antibodies, no T cell responses, and compromised effector function. So it's not going to be as good in terms of an immune system as a human being. So although we have not, and no one has yet, done this experiment in humans, um, two groups collaborated with us to do the experiment in macaques. That's the next best thing. And I'm just gonna show you data from Malcolm Martin. Um, and then I'll summarize uh, all of the data uh, from both groups. So just, just published last week, I think, or the week before in Nature. So these macaques were infected for a long time, from between one and three years. So lots and lots of diversity, uh, lots of time for the virus to work. They were sick uh, in the case of Malcolm Martin. So this is a CD4 count, and you can see that it's gone down, and it's going way down after three years. And this is the viremia, which has been more or less steady um, for a long time. So Malcolm uh, gave these macaques a single shot of antibody. And what happened was, and now this scale is a different scale, of course, a very, very rapid drop in viremia to undetectable. So when people get art, they take some time in order to drop the viremia. But when you gave the monkeys antibody, viremia dropped exceedingly quickly five to 10 times faster than happens with drugs. Um, and then it stayed down for some period and came up just like in the mice. Reason that the viremia came back up is again that the antibody levels went down, uh, correlated again with a drop in the antibody titers. And the, um, when Malcolm used uh, these two, two antibodies from our lab, um, the, uh, the, the rebound was not due to escape because he could retreat and get the same phenomenon. So the virus was still sensitive to the antibody. It did not escape. So here are these uh, two experiments from these two different groups. Um, the Baruch group with uh, Dennis Burton and, and us and uh, Yoshi Nishimura with Malcolm Martin. So two groups, 27 macaques, uh, all of them had been infected from one to three years. All of them responded within uh, seven to 10 days. Again, that was very much faster than drugs. Uh, 25 of them went to undetectable. And then what was surprising uh, was that a single antibody worked. Didn't even need a combination. A single antibody worked. Um, two instances of escape, 
uh, viremia remained undetectable for as long as the antibody levels remained therapeutic, which was up to 60 days. And in the case of Dan Baruch's um, SF162CC3 strain, three of the 17 macaques did not come back. Um, so what did we learn? Well, uh, mice and monkeys are not that different. Um, and it's harder to control this thing in a mouse than it is in a monkey. And in fact, there are reasons, um, at least a, different cup, a couple of different kinds of reasons why this might be true. One is that uh, the uh, mouse, of course, doesn't have an immune system, and maybe the endogenous immune system is contributing to control. We know that that has to be true in a sense, because in humans and in monkeys, viremia goes way up at the beginning, and then comes down to some level which is lower than the peak viremia, and the set point, it's called the set point, is in fact immune regulated. So immune system is contributing. But the other difference, of course, is that the monkeys get infected with SHIV, and SHIV is not HIV, and the mice are infected with HIV. So there are, there are many potential reasons for why this is, why these two are different. And we will not know what happens in humans, really, until we do the experiment. So just to summarize and finish up, um, this area of research has come a long way in a short time. We've come from knowing this to this, which is interesting and I think is uh, interesting not just biologically, but also interesting in terms of potential targets uh, for vaccine development. We've learned something about why perhaps it takes so long for these antibodies to develop, and that's the unusual nature of, of these antibodies in terms of uh, somatic hypermutation. We've learned something about the pathway uh, by which they develop, um, and through the work of uh, Bart Haynes and now um, Penny Moore, we're getting a roadmap essentially for, uh, for, how, this is, for how this is happening. We've learned something about the unusual nature of, of this thing, that it's not a normal germinal center reaction, but probably one that involves multiple rounds of, of the germinal center. Um, and so that, I think, is all um, good news for, for the future in terms of trying to come up with new strategies that, in fact, copy the virus uh, for, for the development of vaccines. But the vaccine that one would imagine with this would be different from all the other ones that, that we've thought about because you couldn't, you couldn't imagine that a monomorphic single antigen was going to go this way. You're really going to have to do what everybody does for all the other vaccines, which is to copy nature and work with things that are in fact evolving and shepherding the antibody response towards where you want it to go. Okay, so with that, um, I'd like to thank my colleagues and collaborators on this. Uh, Florian, of course, is missing here. Florian Klein, who did um, many of these experiments. But it was started by Johannes Scheid and uh, Hugo Mouquet, shown here. And these two students also uh, participated, Josh Horowitz and Ari Halford Strumberg. <coughs> um, and of course, we've had a lot of collaborators uh, with this. We could never have done this uh, without um, help from a tremendous number of people in this field that um, actually welcomed um, us and, and provided reagents and, and really got us uh, started in this. So thanks very much for your attention. But I'm also wondering whether it's possible that some of the <coughs> antibodies that infected people generate could even serve as a blocking antibody and impair the um, neutralizing ability of the more broadly reactive antibodies. Well, most people really don't make a lot of breath and potency. So, um, you know, I, I said, People say 20% generate some breath, um, but it's you know a few strains. Um, 
to get this kind of breath, it's, it's very rare, it's 1%. It's the elite neutralizers that get this kind of breath and make these kinds of antibodies. So you're not gonna block anything that's very good in 99% of the people. Yeah, maybe I'm not making myself clear. I, I guess the question is, those 99% of people aren't making antibodies that are effective. Mm -hmm. yes. But they're still probably making antibodies. Yes, they are. Right? And, and I don't have a sense, I'm out of my field here, but whether they're high affinity, low affinity, you know, right. but they're probably binding and whether they might actually prevent the binding of the antibodies that yes. you would like to generate. Um, yeah, uh, they, People make antibodies, but um, they generally don't bind to the virus that they have. So the virus that they have, in fact, has gotten away from the antibodies that they have. And what's happening in the monkeys, um, one of the things that's happening in the monkeys, just one of them, which is really very interesting, is that the monkeys have made antibodies to parts of the virus where the virus can cover itself up, prevent it from the antibody from getting in there, okay? When the virus escapes from some of these, it's very hard for it to escape. It does has very few possibilities. One of the ways it escapes actually opens it up so that the thing that's already there acts as a second reagent. Even though it has almost no activity, it becomes active because of the mutation. So that's one of the ways the immune system actually, from the monkey, does this thing. And everybody, all people that are infected, make those antibodies. Everybody. of antibodies to get them at, you know, into these different vulnerable regions. Right, so um, I think that, I, mean, I, I, I think I alluded to this, but the thing is, um, there's two groups have done this absolutely beautiful experiment where they take the individual that's infected and prospectively follow the development of the antibody and the virus. And um, in those cases, they, and they, they have, they, they start out with a, uh, an antigen, the virus, which can elicit this kind of response. Um, you could say, well, look, um, why do certain people do this um, and others not? Uh, and, and it could be genetics, but it uh, could also be the antigen, right? And I think there's pretty, one of those experiments, in one of those experiments, the person was actually infected with two different viruses. And the antibodies that came up, came up to only one of them. Uh, so that speaks for the antigen. And there's a lot of macaque data from Malcolm Martin actually that also speaks for the antigen being special. So what I think we learned from this about vaccines is that potentially you would have to select the right antigen that would get the right B cell going. And then also um, come along with the right antigen that made the B cell develop into the right thing. So although only two experiments have been done this way, um, it'll be important to do a few more and learn something about how these things, how these things evolve and to try to copy it. That, that would be, you know, my instinct about how to do this. You could do it in many more complicated ways. You could design antigen by structural base design, et cetera, but this is one possibility. <coughs> do you think, um, it, it seems like uh, that perhaps the easiest or most straightforward way to, to shepherd the immune response to where it needs to go um, a foundation of it would be a live attenuated approach. And I don't know if you think that there's any 
potential for that to be done safely and, and be, be part of the approach. Yeah, I just I don't know I don't know very much about that at all. But I live attenuated probably would work. But it's 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 a question of you know are you going to put a, a mutating HIV virus into a uninfected person? That's that's I think that's the problem that people have faced. First of all, that was beautiful. Um, so the way you describe this, it's really a treatment vaccine. And in particular, you kept making the analogy to the art. So do you envision that this is immunotherapy that would replace heart in terms of uh, treating people but not curing them? And then second, what's, what's your vision in terms of the strategy of a preventative vaccine? Well. Um, for the preventative vaccine, I think that, you know, um, this last question um, was, was about that, is really about trying to copy what happens and learning what happened first and then trying to copy it. Uh, in terms of art and whether this can replace art, that's very unlikely because art is so good. Art is cheap um, and it works incredibly well. It just doesn't get rid of all of the virus. Um, I think we have to learn about what this can do and how it does it. You know, whether it's going to, for example, intensify art. So people have tried to intensify art by adding more than three drugs, five drugs. It doesn't work. There's always some residual viremia that you can detect, low levels, but residual. Um, will this clear that? Possibly. Um, there are a, a lot of ways of, of thinking about what this could do, um, and I think we just have to explore it um, in, in small clinical trials. I'm wondering if you think that the framework uh, mutation aspect of, of the antibodies is, a, is unique to the HIV um, or to, uh, to be in other chronic infections? Um. Uh, I don't know of other infections that would do this, but you'd have to think of one that would evolve somehow. Maybe a trypanosome or something like this would be interesting to study, but I don't think it's... And, and just a, a sort of out-of-the-box out question, but is, it the CD is, is there a defect in the CD4 T cells that's affecting or allowing that framework mutation for some reason? Um, or hypothetical? I don't know. But it's a good question. Uh, thank you for, for a very nice talk. And uh, uh, the thing I wanted to ask about was I, I didn't hear much about adjuvants uh, potentially in the setting of a vaccine. Given what we know from influenza and how we can get increasing in the cross clade type of protection for some type of viral infection with influenza, could there be a role for adjuvants and potentially increasing? the breadth of the antibodies that you would yeah. want to induce? Yeah, I, I, you know, adjuvants are all important in getting the right responses. I think we're just beginning to learn what those responses are, so we're, I think, steps behind that somehow. We're not, I don't think we're there yet. That's very nice. Uh, um, so you, you didn't really mention um, what's happening to the glycation as these antibodies are developing. You know, over the two years time period that the antibodies are developing, what's actually happening to the degree of glycation okay. or is there any different so form of glycation occurring which is really driven okay. by the cell itself rather than the virus? Yeah, people are just beginning to study that. The glycation of the antibody, you mean? Or yeah, the virus? Yeah, but also of the virus itself. Right. So the glycation of the virus, that does shift, uh, and that's been studied uh, before. Um, in particular, George Shaw and Peter Kwong had a beautiful paper on this in Nature many years ago showing how the glycation is, is, is evolving during the antibody response in response to the antibody. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the antibodies, that, that's just beginning to be studied. 
restored the level of CD4 T cells. Um, I believe we get, uh, we don't get a degradation in the CD4 T cells as rapidly with this. In the monkeys, though, uh, what you can see that the CD4 T cells go up as a therapy. So it's yeah, probably yeah. a better model for that. But it's just, yes, you can see that in the monkeys. Thank you.